Second, it's going to take a break and uh, get some more emails up, get some more voices heard, get some more knowledge shared. I'm the only one here today, this afternoon, and uh, our newest addition to the family knows I'm in here, and she's right next door, and she won't shut up. They've got this thing, this thing thinks it's part of the family. It came for a car ride today. It's got diapers. It chases you. It snuggles up with you. It's hilarious. And uh, it knows I'm in here. So it's going to be squawking its head off. Maybe I'll, maybe I will bring her in here. This could be the, the latest member of the family. We'll see if she'll sit tight while I get some emails out. Then maybe later on I'm going to go down the river again. Man Cave's coming along. Um, this stuff isn't tent this isn't this isn't permanent. All this stuff behind me is just getting it up off of that concrete floor, getting it up on the wall, getting air around it. There's if, if I showed you the rest of the shop, you'd probably barf. There's so much stuff. Just stuff. But I'm getting there. So anyways, um, let me go get this little thing, bring it in here and see what we can pull off. <laughs> She'll sit still and let me uh, Get some email shares out or not, so I'd be kind of entertained. Alright. This, this is Willow. The newest lap dog to the house. A cute little bugger, aren't they? And uh, if you don't play with it, well, the girls have got her trained to uh, squawk its head off. If you don't hang out with her handler. it. But it just wants to hang out and observe everything and, and be a part of everything. <laughs> Pretty funny. Right? She'll sit here and share, let us share emails or not. Have a go. The glasses. We need to get that grizzly bear. She'll probably just lay down. We'll see. Isn't that pathetic? <laughs> All right. What do we got? Well, hopefully you never find out what we're talking about. All right. Face to face in the nighttime. Okay, go sit down. All right, what do we got? You can listen to some stories and quit yakking your brains out, right? There's a lot of people here that need to be heard more than you're squawking right now. All right, what do we got? My experience. Hi, Steve. Please refrain from using my name if this makes an email. My name is blank blank. I'm a Canadian Army veteran with over 10 years in and a tour to Afghanistan, currently living in the Kootenays, after living and working in the Skeena region in Northwest BC for almost, for the last nine years. I'm an avid outdoorsman, taught to me about my dad at an early age. I spend as much time in the woods as their busy lives, busy lives allow, and a proud father of two smart, sensible boys, and a newborn daughter. Good for you, man. My experience leaves me guessing if it was an experience at all, it was in late October 2019. I saw the videos you had posted about Zeus the Moose, and it had me all fired up to go for deer. So, one morning while walking into a bay on the Douglas Channel, I felt unusually uncomfortable. Not scared, but hesitant to keep moving into the thick trees and underbrush. As you know, previously living in the Pemberton area, these woods are thick. Anyway, I grew very uncomfortable, for which me is rare. I admit to within 25 to 30 yards of the tree line of the bay and turned southwest, heading to where a creek spills out into the channel and you can get a good view on waterfowl and deer lake. Once heading south, I began to feel my skin crawl. I'm always cautious of bears and I've been charged many times by grizzlies, but this was different. It was silent, but a slight, but a slight south to north wind, raining steady, but not heavy. And all I could hear are my own thoughts of turning around, fighting with my curiosity to push through. I made my way to a fallen tree. Hold on. Okay, there you go. I made my way to a fallen tree that the only way to pass it was to crawl under it. 
As I was about to crawl under, I heard a loud crack, followed by more. Then about 100 yards northeast of me, I could see a tree falling. It didn't seem very odd to me at the time. From seeing this tree fall, I could see that it was most likely a young cedar, about 10 inches at the base. To the best of my knowledge, a healthy tree. After my afternoon of hunting, I decided to have a look at the tree that fell. I made my way to the tree to check it out. I just had to know. Once I reached the tree, I could see it wasn't rotten from the inside or hollowed out, broken off about four feet from the ground and splintered, but to the best of my knowledge, a healthy tree. Could it have been the wind? The wind was mild that day, so I doubted. Was it just a weak tree or was it something else? I pass it off as shit happens and trees falling down in the woods. Months later, I was thinking about it that day and thought that it was all consistent with the experiences you have read on your channel, but I never saw anything when the tree fell. The brush was too thick to see from where I was, but the feeling of being watched and that I didn't think I was alone there that day got me thinking that maybe it was one. Was it pushed over? I don't know. What I do know is that every time I'm down there, I get that hair standing on the back of my neck. Could it be a sixth sense? I think so. One day while deer hunting in the same location, I heard a loud splash in the creek on the west side of the buoy. Then the sounds of something bipedal running across the creek. It reminded me of the sound you make when running through a creek crossing while trying to keep water from going too high on your gators. I've always wondered what would happen if I went back to that location and put something of meaning or a trinket on that tree as a gift to see what happens. What are your thoughts on that? Ultimately, I decided against it. My second experience would be about four months ago during the very short moon season valley. While walking through an area I've always wanted to explore, I found what was pretty obvious to me as a 14 to 16 inch footprint. I took some pictures, but as always, they don't seem to do the justice like in that time and place. I made my way down further down the old path and came up to a shallow creek crossing. As soon as I crossed the creek, the hair on the back of my neck stood. Hold on, all right, come on. Up. The hair on the back of my neck. Across across the creek, the hair stood on the back of my neck. All I could hear was the creek rushing behind me. I felt like continuing on was a bad idea. So I backed out of it. Now these stories aren't as sexy or definite as some of your stories you have read, but so far that's all I have. I still go into the woods as often as possible, but I always walk in the woods saying to myself, I know you're out there, I will not harm you. I'm just here to feed my family. If you leave me alone, I'll leave you alone, repeatedly in my head until the jitters subside. If I have a bad feeling that something isn't right and that feeling doesn't go away, I listen to my gut. I hope the ground was okay. Thanks for all that you do. Quick little message for me. Okay, man, thanks for that invite. Gotcha. All right, thanks for that, man. Appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, as far as being friendly with those things and leaving them trinkets, leaving them gifts. I mean, obviously, I'm not going to tell anybody what to do, what not to do. But I would, I would, my vote would be, uh, my vote would be to uh, not encourage any contact myself. Um, and a lot of people, especially those bleeding hearts out there that want to have some kind of a friendly relationship with the hairy beings of the forest, um, for me, and only me, and I don't preach, I am 100% going by our canines' reactions. That's for me, because I realize that the canines, our canines, are very good readers of character, just like our children are. But canines are our sixth sense. They always have been, they always will be, they have been for generations, hundreds of years, right? And. Uh, 100% of canines sense something very, very alarming when it comes to these beings. So, that is why I would suggest, yeah, just leave them alone. But that's just me. But anyway, uh, thanks for that message. Obviously, you know what's going on out there. I think you're doing the right thing. Keep going. Let them know that you, won't, you don't want nothing to do with them. And uh, to leave you alone. That's what I do. They still make themselves, they make their presence known to me at least a couple times a year, if not more. 
or maybe I, I might even be more than that, but I'm to the point now that I, uh, I might even be a little numb to it, some of the, the feelings I get, because I am on alert. I'm on alert nonstop. It just seems to, I don't know why, but coincidentally, everywhere that I am most passionate about being and hanging out in the middle of nowhere and fishing and hunting is also coincidentally a hot, numerous hot beds for these beings to as well be frequent, frequenting the same places that I do it is what it is until it comes to an end, right? But anyway, looks like this little goat's enjoying some emails. I was going to fire her back into her cage, but we'll see. I'll read another one. She's going to sit here and be mellow and not piss on me. They're fine. <laughs> They definitely are cute little butters, though, aren't they? All right. Well, what else do we got? Let me hang out there. Don't pee on me. Mama, Mama will be home soon. <laughs> All right, what do we got? Yep, I'll bet there's going to be a shit pile of people thinking, uh, be the last thing they ever thought they'd ever see would be to me me to have a frickin' baby goat in my lap sharing emails and video, right? With a grizzly bear beside me. Oregon Lawyer. Hi Steve. Enjoy the heck out of your talks. I want to relate a story told by an old dude from Roseburg, Oregon. I took a job hooking chokers for an outfit working in the North Umpqua River in the middle 70s. We were sitting around eating lunch when one of the crew members asked the guy to tell his Bigfoot story for us newbies. They came back to the landing they were working on after the weekend, after the weekend off, and immediately noticed things were out of place. The first thought was thieves, since items were missing. After they looked around, they found that several 55-gallon drums of oil had been picked up, carried, and tossed over the bank into the brush. Pretty heavy items to pick up. They then saw the tracks in the dirt, made castings the next day. He said he gave them to a local TV guy, but never got them back. One of the crew members called BS on the story, and there was almost a fist fight on the landing. After that, it was weird sitting waiting for the turn of the chokers to come back. Several times we had the feeling of being watched, but it was always, but it always were elk coming to forage where we had drugged logs. I personally never saw anything, but my dad hunted and fished in the area for years and talked about hearing things he couldn't identify but he always figured it was Bigfoot. I live in Northwest Montana and I've heard several stories around our area and several times picking commercial morel mushrooms and burns have heard whoops and whistles and figured it was other pickers but didn't realize till later that we hadn't encountered anyone in the area. Even had a couple of trees fall after hollering one time trying to locate my buddy. We've always been loud before entering and are just to make sure We've always been loud for entering, entering an area just to be sure, to make sure bears and such knew we were coming. Just thought I'd share, keep it up. Yeah, man, thanks a lot for that. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing more from more loggers. If you guys could, it's painless, obviously. There's nothing funny going on here. I'm not trying to suck you in so that we can expose you to your co-workers or anyone else for that matter, all right? So you got some. Just send it in to me and share it with all the people, all right? The people want to know what you know. Expanding on Bigfoot origins. All right, I'll have to get one, one after. All right, here we go. What do we got? Bigfoot encounters. I hope you're doing well. Enjoy listening to all your shares. Thanks for adding to the general knowledge base and very unique learning curve from all the eyewitnesses who've encountered these creatures. Each story you read is a brave effort sent in by people just like me to be heard without ridicule or rebuff. These stories are also the testimony of successful survival victories. But even with weapons, people still go missing anyway, most likely due to a very sudden ambush attack. These creatures are stealthy, stealthy and powerful in so many ways. I've had so many paranormal sightings of several different creatures, some you may find shocking or difficult to believe, but I've documented them as completely as I could. Being a former investigator, I've learned to write up reports that include every possible detail, no matter how small. I don't embellish or elaborate. I just explain all the facts as they appear before my eyes and as I experience them. 
I also include the perception or lack thereof of other people in the vicinity of these sightings at the time that they occurred. I've had several Bigfoot encounters. Although I've never had a dogman or werewolf sighting, but I do have a picture I took of a very large print in the mud of a large canine trap just a few hundred feet from where I live. Over the years, many pets have gone missing from my neighborhood, sadly, including many of my own. Even more remarkable, I've had three sightings of strange humanoids, two of which were in very public settings. I knew you're mainly interested in Sasquatch sightings, so I doubt if you'll even consider these odd humanoid creatures I've witnessed to relate to your listeners, but they were as frightening as any Sasquatch encounter. I'm writing to let you know that I've had experiences with invisible creatures. They followed me with horrendous odors and seemed very close by, but again, I couldn't see them at all. Human eyesight can only see at certain limited speeds of movement. If an object or a creature makes creature moves beyond its perception limit, it or they can't be seen at all. But I believe some of these creatures, including Sasquatch, are also able to use some other mechanism to achieve this invisible capability, contributing to the potential lethality. I've also heard a story on another channel where a park ranger fell into a well-camouflaged hole in the ground got lost in the tunnel system and just barely escaped from these thin white subterranean, subterranean flesh eating creatures who were after him. His event possibly could possibly explain so many missing people. Now I listen to stories that are supposedly true and doing so allows me to connect various details together that actually support and corroborate these eyewitness experiences as they appear into a unified experience base of cryptids. Now, after all, none of these people know each other, but describe very similar, if not exact, cryptid sightings. Let me know if you're interested in my other odd human cryptid sightings, and I will be glad to send them to you. Sincerely, I'll leave your name out from Louisiana. You know what? I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I don't want to sound like a dick when I tell people I don't want to hear about UFO stories, you know? Because I barely have enough time as it is. It's just, it's not a struggle. It's, it's a lot of time to get through all the emails that I do have that were instigated by my viewers of the hunting knowledge on my channel. And uh, we seem to be sticking to that. I mean, I guess we could possibly, we'll see. Maybe everybody could comment what they feel about this in the comment section below. Whether or not we should just stick strictly to what's going on in the forest and the parks where we're at, or should we start including a lot of these uh, extraterrestrial UFO sightings? I don't know, what do you guys think? I know one thing, uh, my inbox is about to get a nuclear freaking explosion if we encourage people to include their UFO sightings because there's so many. But um, I have a feeling there's also a shit pile of support for all those people to see those things as well, with a lot of people that know a lot about them right which I where I don't I don't know a lot about UFOs I have seen a couple myself it is what it is you just look up in the sky and there it is or there it went and that's about all she wrote all you got left to do is tell somebody and that's it right unless you're one of the unfortunate handful of people that either gets to go for a free ride or possibly even a free ride of no return I don't know um, but anyway thanks for that email Maybe have a glance at the set comment section below and let that decide whether or not you should send them to me, all right? Because I hate, I don't like being the person who dictates or decides for people. I want everybody's voice to count. I want everybody to have their own opinion and uh, what the feelings are and come at it as a community, a true community of good, hardworking, honest people, right? Now, isn't this thing hilarious? Is this thing hilarious? As long as it gets to hang out with you, it ain't making a sound. You go put it in its pen in the barn, and all hell's breaking loose. <laughs> I'll tell you what, it doesn't take long for these things to get your number, does it? Anyway, here's another one. A big puzzle piece about Sabe hair. Hi, Steve. I'm the guy who wrote in about the research site, human-resonance.org that has lots of information about the ancient artificial poured rock structures, geopolymers that could be a factor in the energy fields possibly causing the missing people, David Plotis, 
researches and can also be something that sadly can detect if their senses are so much better than humans in other ways. I recently heard some very interesting findings on the Reality Check YouTube channel by researcher Jack Carey when Sabi hair was examined. Jack does quite a bit of dogman research, but the Sabi hair had the unique characteristic, as far as I'm aware, of being able to channel the light from its surroundings, as in the color of its surroundings, into the fiber of the hair, sort of like fiber optic cable using light for communications by humans. Jack was able to take an image of Sabi that was very difficult to distinguish from the background and remove the color from the image of it to bring it out of hiding in the photo. That sounds pretty freaking amazing. Interesting. This light channeling capability of the hair could account for the experiences of people who have been seeing something similar to the Predator in the movies with the Predator's cloaking technology. Except this is possibly a natural savvy trait, or maybe it's genetically engineered into them, if they are something other than completely natural seed discussion or maybe it's genetically dash engineered into them if they are something other than completely natural see discussion below this would make them very hard to see if they stood still and the human looking for them was still it can create a strange effect if they were moving also almost like something made of clear glass it was being moved over the background with some rippling effect as the surroundings were reflected in a distorted way on the body of the being. My bet is that the hair is only present in some savvy groups and may even be a recent development, again, possibly artificially induced. Different humans' eyes have different inherited capabilities in perceiving contrast changes, which is what would help most in distinguishing a being cloaking itself this way. There are also a very few people who have an extra type of cone sensor, sensor to detect color of the eye, allowing them to perceive a wider range of color. Most of the people with this eye mutation are female. One woman was recently found with this ability, and she can see about 99 million more colors than the average person. 99 million? So there's a physical basis for some people being able to see things that literally most people can't. I also know of at least one person who has a much larger hearing range than most humans. Her name is Sherry Edwards, and she can tell if a person has a physical illness or a lack of essential nutrients by the prominence or lack of specific audio frequencies she can hear in their voices. And spent years developing a computer program that she gives away so others can sample voice frequencies and see what vitamins and minerals are lacking in their bodies from the voice profile, which can keep the imbalance from building up to be a problem years before it happens. Now that sounds freaking amazing. As you can imagine, that skill can be very helpful. I don't know if she has ever analyzed any savvy vocal recordings, but that would be kind of interesting. Yeah, I sure would. Get them to her. See what she says. Blah Blah has mentioned the article, who I believe has been shown to be a hoaxer. Regardless, the other information is not coming from Blah Blah, but from Native American knowledge and an extensive DNA analysis of several samples. The samples seem to indicate that the closest known relative of the male side of the Sabbath genetics is an extinct giant lemur that weighs four to 500 pounds. Excerpt from the report. All right, let's hear it. Although some reports I just do not trust myself because of the past history with the scientific community, right? The full scope and significance of the anomalous Sasquatch genome cannot yet be fully grasped by earthly geneticists. Being a technological DNA product that is far in advance of our present capabilities, while not all the hist histologically screened Sasquatch samples presented migration anomalies during the electrophoresis procedures, the many difficulties documented by the forensic team at DNA Diagnostics have successfully thwarted all previous laboratory investigations. However, the failure of contemporary DNA sequencing technology to process Sasquatch samples is in itself strong evidence to artificial, strong evidence of artificial deviation from the genetic expression are displayed by the great variety of life forms on Earth. Both the structural and sequential features of Sasquatch DNA bear the unique, unique hallmarks of advanced genetic engineering and ongoing population management conducted over a period, period 
of many thousands of years by a presently unknown consortium comprised of several genetically enhanced races of extraterrestrial entities. Each of these distinct humanoid species engages in specific tasks for which they have been especially engineered. According to native elders, the Sasquatch species has been artificially created and deployed as shadow guardians of subterranean domains. Wow. Steve, I've read accounts of some people have communicated with extra extraterrestrials and they were told that the Sabi were created by them and put here to do sample collection and that they spend a good deal of time underground in caves and extensive tunnel systems that crisscross the continent. This fits with some of the findings of the DNA analysis as they see things in the DNA that they haven't seen in any terrestrial DNA. This could also point to why the government doesn't want the information to get out as until recently, they were very secretive about any of that type of information getting to the public, as it lessens the grip of their so-called authority over us if the existence of others who cannot be controlled by them gets out. Hopefully this info blows some holes open in the wall of secrecy erected between the people and the truth. Jason. All right, Jason, thanks for that, man. If I can remember, I will try to put a bunch of these, what do you got, one, two links, three, four links in here. Did you hear that burp? I hope he's not getting ready to do a thing on me. Are you? She. But that sounds pretty interesting. And uh, I've heard that storyline more, more than a few times. Um, you know, I have also had a handful of people email me trying to tell me that the government, the government did animal-human cross experiments and that's where Sasquatch came from. With those statements I can say with confidence I disagree because the the history of these beings running around our mountains and forests go back way back before any government were here they go right back to when the Vikings first hit here they reported beings here the natives have you know uh, carved stories and their totals about them verbal history about them for freaking ever way longer way before any of our um, today's failed government groups have been in existence, right? Thanks for that email, man. It's very handy, and I hope to God I remember to put these links in the email once I'm done here and hit the editing table with these new email shares. This goofy little butter's pretty content to be snuggled up into the, the puffy jacket, isn't it? Huh? Mm -hmm. Bar wants to go graze in the yard, so let's get another one out here, and then I'll, maybe I'll go... Uh, Take it outside. Here comes another one. The story I'm about to tell you is something I'm just beginning to start telling people after nearly 40 years. It was 1982, I was still living with my parents at that time. Came home one weekend around midnight, can't remember the exact day. My mom and dad were light sleepers until I came home from my nights of chasing girls and drinking, and they would just die because they knew I was at home safe. After I got home, I fixed myself something to eat and went to sleep on the couch watching TV. At about 2 a.m., I was awakened by our two family dogs. I'll ask a Malamute, who was one of the sweetest dogs you ever met, and a two-year-old Siberian Husky, who was nothing but a big clown, both would lick you to death. When I got up to look outside our den window, which is a 4 by 8 foot picture window, our dogs were raising absolute hell, looking up in the sky across the main highway, about 300 yards or so. They were so mad it was crazy, both looking up howling and trying to give a good bark like those kind of dogs do. The Malamute had saliva coming from her mouth. She's going at it so hard. The husky also looked vicious. But I looked up and what they were barking at was a big orange ball up in the sky hovering about 50 feet opposite the other hill from the hill we lived on across the road. It started out a deep orange color in the middle and went to an almost white towards the outside. Not so bright you couldn't look at it. It looked to be about 40 or 50 to 50 feet in diameter, circular, but kind of like it had a little spikes coming out of it. When I went outside to get a better look, the dogs were still raising hell, but there was no sound from it at all. I could get them to calm down for a second or two, but they would start back up. But I never heard any sound coming from, but it seemed like the dogs could. A little lack of grammar there. 
I stood there in the cold winter night air. Okay, I stood there in the cold winter night, looking in amazement that there were no windows or flashing lights, just a big orange ball that faded to almost white. My parents were already in their dead sleep mode. And the house is a big rectangle shape that was Bedford stone and over 100 feet long. The interior walls were oak over sheetrock, so it was nearly soundproof from where my parents were. So they never got up, and I was so amazed that I watched this thing, I would say for almost 20 minutes, slowly go down in a hollow toward the river, which is about a mile and a half. I consider it one of my biggest mistakes, but I did not wake my parents by running to their window and jerking the curtains back and saying, look, a UFO or something. But I was so amazed and mesmerized, I never did. The dogs barked and howled until they were hoarse, but I still never heard anything, only them barking. I don't know what it was, but I feel like it could have been a natural thing. There's no swamps here. I know it wasn't a comet. And for God's sakes, don't say it was the moon. I know what the moon looks like. And still, there was the dogs. I had never seen them like that before and never did after that. Does anyone have any idea what I saw that cold winter night here in South Kentucky? Signed, Jerry. Well, there you go, Jerry. I'm not a Sasquatch sure, but I shared it. I read it and shared it and I don't know. Let's see what happens. Maybe somebody will address you in the comment section below this video and help you out. Maybe somebody else seen that, right? Anyway, what do you think? Is that enough for now? Time for you to go out and eat some grass? Huh? You just want to sit here. They're definitely goofy little animals, aren't they? I think this thing's uh, four months old, three months old or so. It's definitely an affectionate little thing and just wants to hang out. Right? Wondering where its mommy is. All right, well, maybe I'm gonna go, I'm gonna put you back in the pen, all right? And then I'm gonna go down to the river because I wanna see what's going on with the fish and uh, before it gets dark. And I want to uh, continue sharing some emails from down there. And who knows what will get behind me in those bushes along the river. Maybe a huge bear, you never know. But anyway, keep those emails coming. Share my story, howtohunt.com. Tell my story, howtohunt.com. And uh, we'll get to them. If I haven't got to yours yet, it'll get got to. It will. All right? It's got to be a little patient. And uh, in the meantime, while you're hoping and waiting to hear your story heard and commented on by everybody below, Keep taking in all the knowledge from everyone else, all right? Share my story at howtohunt.com or tell my story at howtohunt.com. Get it in. Okay, let's go, you little turd. Let's get out of here.